So I am Jennifer Smith, and thank you for joining me this evening to have a little conversation about some self-care, um, something that we probably can all use right about now. Um, I work for, her, for Marshall Clinic Health Systems um, in the Center for Community Health Advancement. So our work is primarily done out in the communities, um, helping our community members to have the best quality life that they can. Um, the majority of my work is done with youth initiatives and with youth serving agencies, but um, self-care is really a topic I think that lives in that arena. Uh, individuals who are caregivers in particular in their um, professional life and those of us who are caregivers in our personal life as well uh, really need to practice some self-care in order to optimize our, our overall wellness. So many of us know the idea around self-care, right? That self-care is essential for us to continue to restore ourselves, right? We've heard the phrase, you know, I can't, you can't drink from an empty cup or you need to put your oxygen mask on first, right? We've heard that as well, that if you have an empty cup, you don't have anything to give. The question is, um, how do we make that happen? Right? We all understand that, I believe, but making it a practice and making it a reality is often where people fall a little bit short. And I am one of those people as well, where I will um, you know, be on a, on a great practice of mindfulness on a pretty consistent basis. And then you know, something happens in life and I kind of fall off the rails. And then I have to kind of regroup and get back up again. And I, I think that's the reality of being human, that you know, for us to be um, perfectly consistent all the time is pretty challenging. But if we keep getting back up and, and instituting new practices and keep working, keep working at it, that's really the best we can do. So we're gonna have a little poll here. And the poll is going to be um, asking you about how you feel about your own self-care practice. Do um, you feel great about it, that you are really good at carving out that time for yourself and you're here, I'm hoping to get some new ideas. Um, you feel so-so about it, you sometimes do it and sometimes it's a little bit of a struggle um, or you don't feel so great about it and you really can't figure out how to get started or how to uh, have a system where you stick with it. So I'm gonna launch this poll. And we'll give you a, a minute to respond on how you're feeling about your own personal practice. All right, so we have um, about a 25-75 split. We have three people who responded saying, so-so, um, you know, sometimes I do it and sometimes I don't. And one person um, who identified that they are really doing a pretty bang up job of practicing some self-care, which is awesome. That's the goal we strive for, right? So hopefully through our conversation um, tonight, we can, come up with some strategies in how the individuals who identified themselves as being so-so can really improve on having a much more consistent practice that they feel like is really nourishing and refreshing um, and helping us to feel rejuvenated and kind of continue on in our, in our daily lives. So the first thing that we are going to do is just talk about um, some definitions. So we're gonna talk about some terms. Um, the first terms are really associated with the ideas of um, compassion, fatigue, burnout, what is compassion, and what is compassion satisfaction. So there's times when we um, really exert our energy in helping and supporting others and when we see positive results um, at, at, because of the energy that we've invested, 
Um, we get a sense of satisfaction from that and it kind of feeds and fuels us. Um, but sometimes we feel kind of overwhelmed by our, our circumstances. And so, or maybe we aren't seeing the successes that we're hoping for. And that can lead to compassion fatigue where we become, you know, a little bit more um, distressed because of the demands that are being put on us, right? And the far end of that spectrum is ultimately burnout, that if we don't take the time to practice um, some self-care and ways to, to continue to nourish ourselves, um, ultimately we can become overwhelmed by our situation and reach the point of burnout. Um, and if we reach the point of burnout, um, it, it's, it is a point where we really need to think about our life situation and making some serious decisions about if this situation is really in our best interest. Um, and my own personal example of burnout was when I was teaching, um, I was a special education teacher commuting um, with a four-year-old and a one-year-old at home. And I was exhausted every day. And I had an administrator um, who really didn't try and make things any easier for me, let's just say. And so at the end of, of that school year, um, I really was completely exhausted um, and really was not finding any joy or purpose in the teaching that I was doing. And so I really had to evaluate, you know, at that point, what was really in my best interest. And I ended up changing jobs because um, the commuting and the work environment that I was in was really more than I could overcome by practicing some self-care, right? There were things external to me that were going on. Um, so if you find yourself in that type of situation, um, you may really want to just evaluate what, what your life circumstance is and is it optimal, are you feeling so overwhelmed um, that you're concerned with burnout? So some of the other terms we are going to talk about are stress, reflective practice, and self-care. So the idea of reflect reflective practice is really just taking the time to think about and reflect on what's going on in our lives, what we're doing, um, what we could potentially be doing better. And so our initial poll was a first step in a reflective practice, really thinking about and evaluating how we're doing with taking care of ourselves. You know, are we doing an awesome job or are we doing a so-so job and we're really looking, you know, for some tips and pointers on how to do that practice better. Stress, um, Oh, actually, I jumped ahead of myself. That's in the next slide. So let's talk about self-care, though. Self-care is really a very um, deliberate activity. So if you notice that in the, in the second definition, um, it's something that you plan for, right? So it's not, um, and I think we often kind of get caught in this, and this is what I get caught in myself, is we have this understanding of what self-care is and how important it is. And we think like, oh yeah, I'm going to start doing a better job of doing that. And then we don't have a plan, right? We don't come up with a way that we're going to ensure that that's happening. We just kind of make this decision in our head and then hope for the best that we're really going to follow through. And often that's not, that's not the most effective way. We may, um, you know, have spurts, fits and spurts of, of good practice of self-care, um, but without really having a plan and having some strategy for um, implementation, it's going to be really challenging for us to be consistent in our practice. Um, so thinking about how we're going to um, articulate what our goals are and how we're gonna put a plan together is something that we're gonna talk about in just a little bit. Before we jump to that, we are gonna talk a little bit about stress and a little bit about um, some of the consequences if we continue um, you know, down the road of feeling stressed out and not carving out that time and not um, taking the opportunities to really practice some self-care. 
So if we take a moment to look at our, our stress curve here, um, when we think about you know, the stress response, or at least when I think about the stress response, so if we think about, it, you know, well, we're starting, get, starting to get to that whole overload, um, sometimes we think about kind of acute events, like, you know, the stress response is, um, happens after like a car accident, a natural disaster, maybe, you know, there's some sort of abuse or trauma that happens in, a, in an instant, in a moment that is overwhelming to our system. The reality is um, much of our day-to-day -day stress can be just low-level chronic stress. And if it's ongoing and unaddressed, um, it, it really becomes toxic and has a very similar effect to that sort of um, larger scale acute traumatic event. So if we think about our, our current circumstances right now, um, we're living in a time of chronic stress. All of us are sort of in this shared experience of chronic stress. So if we think about, um, you know, we're living in the midst of a pandemic. We have political discord, regardless of which, you know, side you may or may not affiliate with, or even if you're completely apolitical, it, you know, dominates the news cycle. And so we're aware of all of this tension um, with what's going on in our leadership, we're dealing with this virus, there's a lot of uncertainty. And one of the things that human brains really like is routine and predictability. Our brains really like looking for patterns and then being able to predict what's going to happen as a result of those past experiences. And right now, we, we are all kind of living off kilter. And so our environment is, is just right for us to be experiencing high levels of stress, um, regardless of what our other circumstances might be. So in the chat, I'm going to ask you, um, on a scale of one to five, one being I feel like I have very little stress, five being like I'm really feeling pretty exhausted and overwhelmed, just give me a number in the chat box from one to five. One, I have very little stress right now. Five, I'm really feeling it. Three would be, you know, kind of at the peak of that curve. Like I am somewhere between um, moving from fatigue into exhaustion, right? So somewhere one to five, looking at that scale. So we've got three, three and a half. Anybody else want to weigh in on where their stress level is? I would say mine is probably about three and a half right now. Um, I'm kind of in that same ballpark, I think, with the rest of you. A two. Oh, so someone's, someone's doing a little bit better than the rest of us. A three. So we're, we're kind of in that place. We're not really feeling overwhelmed entirely overwhelmed but we're really kind of on the fringes of we need to to start instituting some practice for ourselves um, to really kind of help nourish what's going on and then we have a four so someone's feeling a little bit a little bit farther along that continuum a little bit more of that sense of exhaustion so what i would like you to like you to think about in terms of this um stress curve is when we as human beings encounter the stress response we move into you know that fight flight or freeze state and so while we um might be having some of this lower level chronic stress our body is still responding to that stress in a stress response and it might be you know, kind of low level enough that we're almost not even aware of it. But we will respond under duress in one of those ways. Um, we might fight and not, you know, literally get into fisticuffs with people, but we might um, start getting a little bit more short-tempered, a little bit more um, 
reactive in situations, right? We're kind of snippy with people around us. That might be sort of moving towards our, our fight response. Um, some of us might flee, which is my, my personal response oftentimes, um, where, the, you know, there's some avoidance. Like, okay, I'm going to procrastinate the tasks that are causing me stress right now, or I'm going to avoid the people that are causing me stress right now um, because it's kind of a protective mechanism. I'm going to kind of flee from my stressors, or maybe I freeze and I just really feel overwhelmed by what's going on around me. Um, and I, you know, really kind of just feel paralyzed and like I don't, I don't know what to do in order to manage um, my environment and to manage my own um, stress level and my own emotions. So we're going to take, um, we're going to take another little quick poll here. We'll go back to the brain in a second. So I would like you to um, think about how do you manifest so when you're feeling stressed out, do you become a little more short-tempered? Do you become avoidant of tasks that might cause you, you know, some, some stress? Or do you freeze and just feel overwhelmed by your circumstances and are not really sure how to, how to proceed? All right, we have a 50-50 split, and none of you share my response of fleeing. <laughs> so we have half the people who fight and become a little more um, short-tempered and reactive, and we have half the people who freeze and really just feel overwhelmed by their circumstances and kind of shut down. And then I avoid. <laughs> I avoid tasks that are causing me stress. Um, so just really creating that awareness um, on how you respond when you are, you know, feeling stress and you might notice that um, you tend to be a little bit more irritable or you tend to really kind of feel overwhelmed and like you want to shut down. And that's also part of that self-reflective practice to, you know, kind of check in with yourself and, and see where you're at and how, how you're doing. Um, and kind of keep a, you know, a little temperature on, on where you're at and what you might need to do um, to help support yourself, especially if you're feeling some additional stress. So I'm going to quick go back to our brain slide here and just um, really kind of reiterate that when we are going through a stress response, um, this, this front part of our brain, so I like to use Dan Siegel's hand model of the brain, if you're familiar with Dan Siegel. Um, this front part of our brain behind your forehead um, is really our control center. It's where we reason, problem solve, communicate, all those higher level thinking functions happen in this prefrontal cortex. And in the base of our brain, we have sort of our survival reactive brain, our amygdala is housed here. This is, you know, very emotional. Um, this is where we live when we're in fight or flight. And so the reason that we may become um, disconnected from what we're doing, maybe we flee, we shut down, we become more irritable, is because we start living more and more in this emotional center of our brain and have a harder time connecting to this higher level thinking brain. So when I talk to kids about um, having, you know, strong kind of em emotional responses to things, we kind of talk about popping the top or flipping your lid. And so what happens is when you have the stress response, you have trouble accessing that thinking part of your brain. And so then it becomes really, um, situations can become overwhelming um, quickly. And so the idea behind self-care is carving out space for you to be in a calmer mental state. So on that stress chart we looked at, 
you know, sort of that lower level green area where your brain um, can kind of re, you can reconnect that front part of your brain, that prefrontal cortex thinking part of your brain that helps you reason and problem solve and communicate. And by continuing this practice, you strengthen those connections so that even under stress, if you were building in time to um, practice some self-care, it's easier for you to gain, regain control of this prefrontal cortex, even if you're experiencing some stress. So that's an important benefit um, from practicing our, our self-care. All right, so let's take a look at some of the impacts, personal impacts, um, but that happen as a result of us, you know, reaching that stage of compassion fatigue, right? We might um, lose our appetite or we might eat to kind of feed sort of that empty feeling we might have because we're feeling really overwhelmed or stressed out. We feel like we have a loss of purpose. We kind of lose joy in what we're doing, right? We might become more irritable. We might become more absent-minded um, because that focus is really in that front part of our brain. Um, you know, we have, might have difficulties relationally with other people, especially if we become irritable and a little more snippy, right? We might become more detached. So there's really a lot of potential impacts on us as individuals if we continue in this sort of stress cycle and don't really take the time um, to practice some self-care and help ourselves kind of recenter and regroup. There's also some potential professional impacts. Right, so job tasks is um, one of the terms that you know jumps out to me as a fleer. I avoid job tasks that I don't want to do if I'm feeling really overwhelmed, right? And so that can impact my professional life. Um, you you know, people have poor morale. We're exhausted. We start blaming other people potentially for what's going on or what's happening or not happening in our environments. We have difficulty. Um, with interpersonal relationships, maybe we call in sick more frequently, right? So there's all these other consequences that are possible um, if we continue down this road and end up in sort of that space of compassion fatigue and, and don't carve out that time to take care of ourselves. So if we get to the place where we realize um, that we really are kind of feeling overwhelmed, again, going back to that um, rating one to five, where are we feeling right now on that stress curve, right? And so those of us who were like three, three and a half, four, we are being self-reflective and we are understanding that we are very likely showing some symptoms of kind of this concept of compassion fatigue, that we're all kind of worn down from all of the practices and things that we've been doing in our daily lives, our overload of work, you know, whatever our, you know, life circumstances are, maybe we're um, schooling kids at home and trying to do a job, um, or maybe we're, you know, an essential worker and we're just out there working long hours, really trying to help keep things going. Um, regardless of our circumstances, Taking the time to kind of do this reflective practice allows us some space to say, you know, I really am feeling overwhelmed right now. And so I need to be gracious with myself and understand that I need to carve out that time in order to bring the best version of me to whatever it is that I'm doing, right? So if it's my job, if it's my family, um, you know, if it's my circle of friends, if it's my support network, if it's, my, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be, in order for me to bring my best self into that space, I need to carve out some time um, and prioritize me in order to be the best person I can for others, right? So it's going back to that idea of um, filling that empty cup, right, or putting your oxygen mask on first. When you take a little bit of time to be self-reflective, then that helps us to know we need to start taking care of, of me for a little bit in order to be able to help others. So if we um, don't 
to have that self-reflective practice and we don't start incorporating some restorative practices into our life, right, then we're just going to continue to compound this, this stress that's in our environment and keep, keep getting stuck in this whole stress cycle. So one of the quotes I love um, from Bruce Lee is that when we're under duress, we don't rise to our expectations, we fall to our level of training, which to me in the, in the realm of self-care means if we have not been intentionally carving out time and implementing a practice for self-care to help us to reconnect to that you know, prefrontal cortex when we're really living under stress, um, then we're going to fall back into that emotional brain and we're going to become reactive or we're going to flee or we're going to freeze because we're not strengthening those connections for ourselves in times when we're not feeling stressed out, right? It's just like exercise, you know, you build your muscles by doing a consistent exercise routine. It's the same thing when we're feeling the stress. If we are not consistently taking the time to build in this practice, and then we're just going to fall back into, you know, that emotional brain stress response when we feel really overwhelmed um, by what's going on in our, in our life circumstances. So there are um, a number of areas that we can look at when we're thinking about our plan for self-care. So there are really eight dimensions of wellness um, that you can see on the wheel on the right. One of the blogs um, that I enjoy reading um, is on the left, The Blissful Mind, and she identifies five of those eight. Um, she leaves out environmental, occupational, and financial. Um, if those are areas that you feel are areas that are causing you some stress, then I would encourage you to incorporate those into your practice. Um, but she really highlights um, sort of the, the spiritual, emotional, social, intellectual um, aspects of wellness in her self-care descriptions. So thinking about, you know, what are areas that I really need to focus on? And sometimes we do some areas really well, and we do other areas not so well. So, you know, maybe we're really good at the intellectual aspect of self-care, you know, maybe I'm um, an avid reader or I really enjoy doing activities um, that kind of exercise my mind and I'm really good at that. And maybe I'm pretty good at, at physical care. You know, I eat pretty well and I make efforts, um, you know, to move my body and make sure that I'm exercising. Um, but maybe right now I'm not doing the best job of social, right? I don't have the same level of social interactions because I'm at home, I'm working from home, my kids are, you know, schooling from home, and so I'm not making those typical connections that I would be making, and so maybe I'm, I'm missing out on, on some of that social interaction that I really need to work on. So how, what can I do to help um, to elevate sort of that practice of connecting with others? Or maybe spiritually, I'm not, I'm not really focusing on that aspect or my emotional health. Maybe I'm not taking time to really address some of those other areas. So taking a little bit of time to think about what are some of the areas that I really need to focus on. So in the chat box, maybe drop what you think is the one area that you think you probably should target first for a plan of action. So what area do you think you should probably focus on? And you can use either, you can, you know, use the wheel that has the eight, or you can, you know, use the five, either way. But think about what do you think are, is the one area that you would like to focus on as we start talking about how do I create an intentional plan to make sure that I'm gonna follow through um, and really put this plan into action to take care of myself.
So we have a couple physical, social, emotional. Excellent. So I want you to keep those in mind as we start talking about how we're going to create a plan to help make sure that we start implementing this strategy, that we're not, you know, just going to think about it and then just hope that it happens or, or wish that, you know, all of a sudden on, you know, Friday, I'm going to really be motivated to start practicing mindfulness every day, right? If I don't have a plan of action, when Friday comes, my day is going to be full and it's probably going to fall to the end of my list. And the next thing I know, it's going to be the next Monday and I haven't done any mind. So having that plan is really how we make all of this happen. So there are um, really some simple activities that we can start thinking about. And this, this really focuses on the five um, aspects that were from the Blissful Mind blog, um, which I think everybody identified um, an area from those five. So this, this will work for us today. But thinking about um, what are some activities that are listed in each of these categories that I think um, are activities that I could practice or implement. And this is not an exhaustive list. There are certainly other activities that you um, could think of that would be beneficial to you or that you might gravitate towards um, more so than anything on this list. The one thing I do really want to highlight is we as a society are very good at monetizing things. And so self-care has really become a huge industry. And people um, sometimes think that you really need to have a lot of resources in order to practice quality self-care. Right? We have these images of spas and, you know, I'm going for a massage and those types of things. And while those are really enjoyable um, and things that you can do, the reality is the practice of self-care can be much more simple. It can really be, you know, I'm going to spend um, five minutes every morning doing a mindfulness meditation before I start my work. Day. Um, it can be... If I, you know, have physical activity as my goal, um, I can share with you, I have my little list here. My husband is a, is a physical therapist. You probably can't really see this, but he made a list for me. Um, I, there's two activities in three different categories, and I need to pick one of each of these to do when I have a 15-minute break between um, work duties during the workday. And I have it just taped right to my monitor. So when I have a little bit of time, you know, I will do um, plank and I raise my heel in plank for 10 seconds, six times on each side, right? And then I'll come back and do my next activity. And then I can choose something um, from the next category on the list. And that's a really simple way for me to incorporate that physical activity throughout my day. I spend a lot of time sitting because I'm on my computer the majority of the day. So it, it, that's a really easy way. And I made it um, convenient because it's right, it's taped off the end of my monitor. So when I'm looking at my screen, it's there as a reminder to me, right? That this is something when there's a break, I have it right here. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to, you know, load a video or go searching on my phone. It's just simple sitting right here, easy for me to implement. Um, you know, the social interaction, I can take a little bit of time and call people or schedule, um, you know, sort of a FaceTime with someone that I haven't talked to. And maybe I decide that I'm going to do that twice a week and I'm going to kind of identify who those people are that I really would like to connect to, right? So there's a number of activities on here that are really simple and that don't require investment. Um, certainly not monetary investment and even small time investment because so many of us are so busy um, with everything that we have going on, all the demands in our life that we can really fit these practices of self-care into very small um, time periods within our day. We know through research, um, for an example, that mindfulness, if you do um, 10 minutes of mindfulness practice a day, that is enough to significantly 
change the, the struct, internal structure of your brain, that you can really start building some strong pathways to that prefrontal cortex and you can help your body um, to remain more calm under stress just by taking 10 minutes out of your day. Um, which seems like, you know, that's really not that much time as long as you um, carve out that time and have a strategy and a plan and how you're going to make that happen. All right, so how are we going to start putting our strategy and our plan into place? So some of you may be familiar with SMART goals. And this is um, really the simplest and most straightforward way to put on paper what I want to do, right? So if I've identified that I would really like to improve my physical health, I'd really like to improve my emotional health, my social health, um, I'm going to identify a goal for how I'm going to do that. Um, and here is an example. So the top is, um, sort of a template where you can fill in where the blanks, the parentheses are, and the bottom is a completed example so that you can kind of compare what it might look like. So I'm not um, going to ask you to share your SMART goals with us right now, but I would like you to think about, um, you know, what might be a practice and can I kind of start plugging this in? You know, I will, um, you know, practice mindfulness at each morning or four mornings a week or five mornings a week or however however you want to identify the practice that you would like to do based on the area that you identified as the one that you really need to prioritize right now. And then thinking about how will you incorporate that into your day. Uh, I had a, um, I participated in a webinar recently where one of the um, presenters had shared um, some really simple ideas that she had practiced for herself. So um, she was really feeling overwhelmed um, and a bit frozen as a result of her own stress response. And so she decided to do positive affirmations. Um, to help her feel sort of that sense of, I have control over my environment. And so she wrote positive affirmations and she pasted them throughout her house in areas that she knew she would frequent. So she had a positive affirmation on her bathroom mirror so that when she was getting ready in the morning, she could read the positive affirmation and, um, and recite it to herself. She had one on her work computer, she had one on the refrigerator, Right? So as she walked around her house, it was really kind of in her face. She didn't have to do a whole lot um, to practice those positive affirmations because she planned and strategized, how am I going to make, make this goal happen? What is going to be my plan of implementation? Um, she also talked about, you know, really increasing her water consumption if she was not doing a very good job of that. And so she, you know, had a water bottle and she made sure that every morning she filled it up and she sat it right next to her when she was working because it was convenient. It was right there. She took sips almost unconsciously throughout the day um, because it was convenient. And she had kind of thought through that plan, right? She had a goal in mind. And then she thought, thought through the plan on how am I going to implement this? How am I going to make this happen for myself? So once we identify the area that we really want to focus on and we have kind of a goal in mind, the next piece is a way to help us track and kind of hold ourselves to that plan, right? So creating some way um, for us to really hold ourselves accountable. Are we doing what we say we're going to do? So if we're you know, going to be ambitious and target multiple areas, we can certainly do that because um, ultimately that's best practice, right, is to do um, as much as we can in these arenas to maximize our overall health and wellness. So hopefully I'm moving every day, I'm, you know, doing some activities throughout the week that are really feeding um, my intellectual self, hopefully I'm connecting with people, um, taking time to sort of be reflective in sort of that spiritual category, 
right? I'm, I'm doing some self-reflection on my emotions and really being connected to how I'm feeling. Maybe I'm going to start doing a gratitude journal um, or I'm just going to start tracking and journaling my emotions, you know, on a regular basis. So, you know, incorporating a journal into my practice. It would be great if we ultimately could incorporate all of these areas into our um, regular self-care practice. And it doesn't have to be all of them every day, but if we had a plan on how to implement them throughout the week so that we were doing all of them at some point, um, that would really be ideal. So there are other methods for um, tracking. So that's just one simple template. Um, if you are creative and interested in like bullet journals, there are so many amazing templates that you can find um, on the internet. So Pinterest has great bullet journal um, uh, templates that you can kind of create your own. Um, or, you know, you can have just a simple calendar, like in the, in the top, the wellness tracker, where you just have a calendar. You know, it can be as simple or elaborate as artistic or, you know, just utilitarian as you want it to be. Um, so what really works for you is a little bit of an experiment. You know, how am I going to put something together that's really going to help me um, track how I'm doing? I'm going to be engaged in that. Um, you, there's also things you can purchase um, if you are interested in doing something like that. So one of um, the things that I do, it's called the five minute journal. And it, um, it has a, a templated um, sort of a journal page for each day. And I do mine um, right before I go to bed. And so it has a little section on gratitude. It has a little section on um, goals. It has a little section um, on sort of self-reflection for the day. And it, it's a kind of a nice way for me to end my day. So as I'm transitioning into sleep, it's kind of a nice, um, it's kind of a nice way to move into that when I'm practicing sort of that gratitude and that, that reflection of my day and what went well and um, you know, what were some of my highs for the day and then what are my goals for tomorrow? And it's really short and sweet and I can close it and put it on my bedside table um, and it's right there and it's convenient, it's easy for me to implement. So if you know, you're know you more, um, you feel like you'd be more likely to practice if you had something that was really templated and already put together for you, there are resources out there um, like that that do exist. Um, otherwise, as I said, you can be very creative and kind of create your own. Um, and that in and of itself can be a self-care practice is your coloring, you know, sort of that, that beautiful diagram with all of the a rainbow color, colored pencils. I, you know, I think like that would be sort of a very spiritual um, kind of activity in and of itself, just really taking time to be reflective that I'm carving out this time to take care of myself. And I've, you know, created this, this beautiful tracking mechanism that in and of itself is a self-care practice. So thinking about um, how, how you want to track and how you might want to um, hold yourself accountable to some of these practices. All right. Oh, and this looks a little blurry on my screen. I don't know if the slide is blurry for you, but there are also some apps um, that I think can be really beneficial for the implementation practice. So one of the apps um, that I enjoy is the app on the right called Youper. And the thing that I like about the Youper app, well, there's multiple things that I like about the Youper app. Um, the Youper app is free. And it also um, allows you to set a timer. So I set reminders for myself at, uh, you know, about 745, my Uber app will send me a reminder and remind me that I need to practice mindfulness before I start my workday. And so that's a really a nice way to help me hold myself accountable because it sort of has this built-in reminder. Um, and then it, it has this whole process where um, it leads you through some questions to be kind of self-reflective on, um, 
your own emotions and how you're feeling and what might be contributing to that. And then there are some mindfulness practices and some gratitude practices built in. If you want to use um, the Uper app to do that, you can use it for some of those practices as well. Um, otherwise, the Calm app and Insight Timer are both two of my very favorite um, mindfulness apps. Insight Timer is free and has tens of thousands of guided meditations that are available. It has um, some lessons, some introductions, you know, some, if you're, if you're new to mindfulness, it has some, you know, seven days to start a mindfulness practice courses that you can participate in. Um, and those are very structured. And so that can also be very helpful in trying to, you know, jumpstart and implement a new practice. So are there any um, practices or strategies that anybody is using that they find particularly helpful um, that they might want to share with the rest of us so that we can see what other people are using um, to kind of help, help them with their own self-care practice. So there are any, any tips we want to share with each other. Oh, insight timer. Oh, I haven't used it before sleep, but that's a good idea too. They have really good um, fall ones to fall asleep to. And there's also one if you get up in the middle of the night, which oh. has been happening to me lately. I'll just randomly get up at two o'clock in the morning and be wide awake. And it's like very specific to falling asleep in the back, falling back asleep in the middle of the night. Wow. Yeah, that oh, works really well. That. Yeah, that's great. I occasionally have that waking up in the middle of the night myself. And so that would be nice to have, have some strategy rather than um, rolling around. I try to do some deep breathing when I'm, um, mm -hmm. when I wake up in the middle of the night and just kind of calm, you know, my, my nervous system, but um, that doesn't always doesn't always resolve it but having having a like a guided meditation would be really nice yeah yeah it's a really good one that's cool i will definitely have to look into that because the insight timer is on my phone no other strategies any other tips anyone else wants to share There are so many resources out there, you know, that if you, if you carve out just a little bit of time, um, once you identify the area that you really want to focus on and what your goal is, you can find templates for just about anything that can really help you um, formulate a plan to make that, that happen, to help with that sort of implementation of what, of what it is that you're trying to incorporate into your daily practice or into your weekly practice. All right, so the overall idea here with this, with a self-care practice, right, is the idea of an empty cup, right, an empty lantern provides no light, that we're, you know, really not fulfilled, we're not the best version of ourselves. And so taking this little bit of time that we carve out for ourselves, if it's physical, intellectual, emotional, social, spiritual, whichever arena we decide we want to focus on first, or the one that we think we're maybe um, not doing as well in that arena, um, that is the fuel that helps us to shine more brightly, right? It helps us to be the best version of ourselves. It helps us to move out of that sort of emotional, um, reactive, stressed out space where um, sometimes we live just as a result of life. And so by carving out this time and helping ourselves um, to really incorporate some practices helps us, helps us to be the best that we can be. So are there any questions? We have a few minutes left. Any questions about practices, strategies for implementation, um, anything? 
that we can maybe have some conversation about, help brainstorm, problem solve. It's nice to have other people um, to kind of talk to, talk through and think about if there's some things that we're not, we're not really sure how we want to address it or what direction to go. So Jennifer, this is Maureen Miller, and um, the reason I joined today is because I'm doing something called Long Path Learning, and we're learning about teal organizations, and I chose to um, focus on self-care, not only for myself, but for my entire team, nice. and so I've been doing a lot of different things um, to try to promote self-care within our agency. And so that's really why I'm here today, just to get some more information about other things that I could be missing. You know, obviously, I don't know. I'm just learning myself. So I just wanted to get a little more insight. So thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I, I will share with you um, that one of the things that we did um, in our team, so I... Um, had been the lead for an after school program that targeted at risk youth. And it was a pretty demanding um, environment, you know, the staff that was engaged with youth every day. And one of the practices that we incorporated, and we found it really beneficial, and we enjoyed doing it as a team, um, is we did a mindfulness practice every day before the kids would arrive at the after school program. So we had, um, kind of a comfortable space in the building and we would all meet there and we would use the insight timer. We would do some guided mindful meditations. And it was also um, really sort of a social because at that time we were in person. So we were interacting with each other, um, but even virtually we could do, um, you know, a, a brief mindfulness meditation, but just incorporate, just engaging in that practice as a group helped us to implement, to be kind of accountable to each other. If someone was kind of overwhelmed that day, then someone else would say, hey, remember, we're going to go and meet and, and do this practice. And it really helped all of us to reset before the kids came into the program and, and helped us to kind of be the best version of ourselves when um, we were interacting with the kids in our program. So I think when you can, you know, possibly do some practices together, that's, that's another benefit. That can be a great team building activity, and also um, practicing self-care. Any other questions or, or thoughts? Everybody's feeling pretty, pretty good. We feel like we can start implementing some practice. All right, so if, if you are, um, interested and willing, I thought we would end with our last couple minutes, just doing a really brief um, kind of a mindfulness meditation before we close our session today. So if you're willing to do so, um, just find a comfortable seat. So make sure that you're kind of anchored in your chair, maybe your feet on the floor. You know, your spine is not rigid, but you're not slouched. You kind of have that strong, a little bit of a strong back. If you're comfortable closing your eyes, you can do that. Um, if you are, are not, then that's fine. Um, I would recommend that you just find a spot to focus. So you're just gonna have your eyes focus on one spot and um, just kind of let them go a little bit blurry. Okay, so we're gonna just find this comfortable position. And what I would like you to do is just notice your breath. We're not gonna change it or control it, just notice our breathing in and breathing out. <coughs> and we're just going to take a moment to marvel at how amazing our bodies are, that we know exactly how much air we need with each breath, and it happens without a thought, that our body just does it and takes care of us and nourishes us with oxygen each breath.
And then I would like you to visualize with each inhale that you are really breathing in joy and light and happiness and calm. And those feelings are being inhaled and then traveling throughout your body to the ends of your fingers, to the ends of your toes, breathing in that joy and that light and it's nourishing your body. And as you exhale, you're letting go of any stress, anything that's weighing you down, any worrying thoughts. They're being released with every exhale. So we're breathing in joy and light. And we're releasing those things that are weighing us down with each out breath. Then I would like you to focus on your fingers and your toes, kind of wiggle them around. Maybe have a good stretch. Slowly open your eyes as you're ready. Have one final deep breath in. Let it out. And hopefully you're able to enjoy the remainder of your evening. Take a little time for yourself. Implement a little self-care before you uh, go to bed tonight if you can. And thank you all for joining in our uh, webinar today. If you have any um, questions afterward, if you think, oh my gosh, I should have asked this question, I am putting my um, email in the chat box. You could always send me a quick email. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thanks, Jen. Have a good night. Yeah, thanks. You too, Laura.